Okay. Hey guys, um, today's change of heart and how God really, really woos us. Um, it's a young man that's going to come on and he's going to give his testimony. And it's so important that young men give testimony because the testimony is what's going to change people's lives and people's hearts. Let us be honest, that's what happens. And this young man is so important because he's incredible and his life story is incredible. God will woo us to the ends of the earth. He will woo us even if we decided to go to hell, he'll still woo us out of it. He will woo us out of all situations because he's a, he is a relentless God. And he loves us the moment that we are, we think that we're conceived, trust me, and I say think, because God loves before we would even anything in our, the womb of, our, of the mother's belly. He loved us then. So that should tell you how much he loves us now, that he's willing to go to any length, even sacrificing his own son. So you think about that love. That's a, a, a different kind of love that most of us don't understand, but that's the kind of God that I serve. That's the kind of God that you serve. You don't want to serve a God that won't do that for you. You don't want to serve a God that doesn't do anything, just sits there looking like a statue or it's in a book, but it's not real. See, one thing I like about the Bible, it's real. And Jesus is real because he lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit is in us and he works in us. The other gods, they're dead. They ain't doing nothing. Buddha, big old fat thing, ain't sitting there eating, just <laughs> doing nothing. Harry Christian, nothing. This is all self-appointed people. Muhammad, nothing. There's not a love thing in the Quran. I've read it. Nothing, no healing, no love, no power, no nothing. And it's the most amazing thing people like. But I love Jesus. And Jesus loves you. And he wants you to be as real as humanly possible. He wants you to understand his love, his power, his okay. Because that's how much he loves you. And here is my lovely Drew. How are you? I'm, you doing, I'm doing great. How are you? Sorry for being a little bit late. I got I got delayed on the way. It's okay. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I was just telling everyone how God woos us. Even when we don't deserve it, even when we're going the wrong direction, he just keeps pursuing us no matter what. Amen. And I want you to tell everyone, this is Drew. I want you to hear his story because he has a testimony that shall rock your world. Just when you think your life is, a, a, mm, his life got a, got a few kinkles in it so drew go ahead and tell us start from the beginning babe okay yeah i, I think i think i might use the word kinkles going forward too i like that <laughs> word. we're gonna have to use that word going forward for sure so uh my name is drew yeah i'm i'm 34 years young uh my testimony starts at at birth yeah i was i was born in busan south korea and um i was shortly after uh left at a at a fire station there in Busan, South Korea. I was delivered to an orphanage and adopted by American parents uh, around the age of one. Came to the States and started my life here. And uh, you know what? When you're a military kid, like I'm sure many, many people out there can relate to or have gone through it, you know, you're moving quite often depending on, you know, where your your parents get stationed and depending on, upon promotion and stuff like that. So we, we moved quite often. And as a child who had been adopted and you move from city to city, you know, it gets, even as a child, it, it, I don't know if it got frustrating or if it just got scary ultimately to have to continue to face making friends and then saying goodbye to them so shortly after you met them or knowing inevitably 
you weren't going to be able to develop a friendship with them even at a young age. So eventually I just turned into the child who kind of just existed. I would sit in my chair at school. I would go ahead. Go ahead. I want to go back to when you were, before you were adopted. Mm -hmm. You never knew your mom or dad. Right. Right. Uh, did you have a name? Uh, I had a name. It was Seung Byung Park. Young but Park. that was given to me. That was given to me by the orphanage. I was delivered at, of course, at the fire station with no like. So you had no name yet. Yeah. Correct. I don't have any record of a name. I don't have medical history. I don't have genealogy or, or anything like that. So the name that I was given was given to me um, at the orphanage that, of course, was sponsored by the adoption agency. So. I want people to understand what we're talking about. He, God had a life even back then because see, you don't, people don't get that. You may not have had a name, but God knew you, baby. Correct. Because See, my point is, your parents, anything could have happened to you. But God was seeing after you, even at the fire department, even going through the orphanage. And now you were fortunate to get adopted by this couple who was looking for a kid. Now, That's right. I tell you, military life ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. Making friends everywhere you go and losing them at the same time. And that's, that's right. what I'm talking about. That I can, I can definitely co sign to that for sure. My, my point to you is how many places did you move? <sighs> uh, I've lived in, and this is from age one to when I was just before in fifth grade. I probably lived in nine or 10 different places. How did you make friends? I didn't. Okay. Uh, so from zero to four, you know, you, you, you play with your, your parents, friends who have kids and stuff like that. But, you know, honestly, even my parents didn't have many friends, you know, we would live on the base and oh, we would just kind of get stationed from base to base. So it wasn't like, you know, we got to move to a place where we knew we, we knew people, you know, it was very much, it was their profession that brought them there. Right. And it was my parents that brought me there. So it, it wasn't like a lot of people, you know, nowadays they can move back home to be close to family or they can move to be close to friends like that. That wasn't the case. So, you know, it was kind of like we went through that all together where we were kind of each other's first friend. If that, I mean, if that makes sense, I mean, it, it just kind of, that's just kind of how it was. It was very isolating. I would say that's a that's a 100% a fair word. And if it wasn't true, it's at least how it felt as a child. As a child. Okay. I want people to get a clear understanding. A lot of people don't understand military life. Um, it's, it's, it's not for the weak. <laughs> I mean, nope. it's going to be honest, it is not for the week. Um, Definitely not. Kids go through, just like a regular kid go through a lot. Well, imagine that 10 times more for a military kid because they just get started in life. And then you got to move and go someplace else and start it all over again. That's and right. you got to keep doing it and keep doing it. It just, it rips your heart out. I, I totally, I totally grasp it. Go ahead, babe. Okay, so I uh, got news that my father had been stationed in San Antonio, Texas, which is where I am currently. Okay. And uh, that this was going to be his retiring station where he was going to retire. And so, you know, when you hear the word retire as a, you know, a fifth grader, you're not Oh yeah, you know that that's awesome. You know, like you're 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 like I don't know what that means, but cool. You know, I think you come to at least trust the fact that your parents are know what they're doing. And so they said retire. Then they they sat down. And they explained to me what that meant. That meant that we were going to be living in San Antonio for quite a period of time and perhaps permanently. Um, and 
for a child who had just gone through moving as many times as I had and the abandoned, you know, isolated kind of feeling where you don't make friends, you kind of, you like lick your chops a little bit, you rub your hands together and you're like, okay, you know, now, now the friends that I make, I'm going to get to hang out with for a little bit. And so, you know, maybe someone else can testify out there. Maybe it's just my experience, but when you get the opportunity to initially create new friends, when you are quote unquote, the, the new kid on the block, the easiest friends to find are the ones who are most skilled in manipulation. And so for me, I didn't go into it with a checklist. Like, this is what I'm looking for in friends. I was just looking for friends, to be honest. So, of course, you know, as I think I've always been strategic in things that I've done, even when I didn't know what I was doing, I still wanted to think I knew what I was doing. And so, yeah, I, w- I went after the, the kids that were more popular, probably. And of course, they were popular for for probably the the wrong reasons but nonetheless you know I I took the step I ended up making several friends with these people and you know every everything changed about little old isolated Drew really quick you know I I started getting my hair cut differently I started purposefully shopping for school clothes that were identical or similar to the to the peer group that I had I started to speak like the peer group I had and I started ultimately to act like the peer group I had and so you know this peer group and I were friends for quite a long time you know my grades dropped my demeanor at home dropped my respect levels with my family dropped the activities that I started to partake in but started to become less and less legal you know I did get into you know alcohol at a young age cigarettes at a young age, drugs at a young age. Parents, and did they notice this? I, I mean, my mom says that she recognized confidence, but what she calls disingenuine or fake confidence in me. So she she saw a change okay. in me. Okay. And she knew like the, the respect factor growing up in a military family, I'm sure you know, where their disrespect is not tolerated. Ooh. And so when I started to have a little bit of attitude or twang in my voice or responses, you know, my, my dad was quick to, you know, bring discipline. My mom was quick to, to bring discipline, but I just, you know, Carl, I just, I didn't care. You know, I was like, I'm pop, I'm popular. I'm living my best life. Y'all are haters and you're impeding my progress and in, in becoming the the cool kid and how why would you do that to me and oh know, yeah saying, I, I remember that that uh time in my life you know I thought I was grown now your parents sound like some of mine and I thought I was grown I'm gonna be honest I was smelling myself you know exactly what I'm saying and I you know my my mom was all like that. I'm like and let me tell you she goes what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes she goes what did you say i'm like um uh she goes i will be right back and mm-hmm. she stepped out she came back she had a gun in her hand and i remember oh. she goes now how would you like to go in the same way you go out because i make sure that i will have a box for yourself you don't know who you mess with up in here i am not your friend i am your mom and you will show me respect you ain't paying no bills up in here that's right i just that's went right well, since I want to live, step <laughs> <laughs> on down. <laughs> That's my crazy mom. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My dad just no questions asked, no, you know, assume the position, none of that. If he heard attitude or heard from my mother that there was attitude, discipline came and, and it came quickly. It came swiftly and and justly, you know. So Continue that onward. I got, you know, that spirit of rebellion and started to act out. And I told my parents, you know, when the the first day that I can leave legally, 
I'm gone, you know? And so I graduated high school by the grace of God. And I, I did, I left home and things didn't get better. You know, I, you know, I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm free. I can do what I want. And you realize there's bills out here and you got, there's you got to feed yourself all of a sudden. And so, you know, like what you're, when you're that level of rebellious, you're you're equally arrogant and you're equally overconfident in yourself. And so then you start to do what you gotta do to pay the bills. And you know, that led to selling and distribution and just gathering with even more wrong people, of course. And so that was my life for a while. Fast forward and I was, you know, doing doing a good deed <laughs> and uh, while walking down the side of the road to deliver gas to a friend of mine I was struck by a Jeep Grand Cherokee and landed on the hood of that Jeep Grand Cherokee with a broken hip two broken legs and a broken clavicle on the left side um, I was air vacked to, at the time, what was called BAMC, which stands for Brook Army Medical Center. It is now SAMC. Uh, and the news that I woke up to was not good. You know, it was like one of those, those movies where they get in the accident, they wake up and, and both of their arms are in the air, both of their legs are in the air. And, you know, the, the doctor came in and said, you know, Mr. Anderson, it's, it is not looking good that you're going to, to be able to walk again. I didn't have any spinal damage, but I also had so much damage to the lower half of my body that, that they didn't know that it was possible for me to, to learn how to walk again. They gave me a very, very slim chance. And in that moment, not knowing what God had planned, but knowing my own cockiness and arrogance and competitive nature, I was like, doctor, if you say there's a 1% chance, I'm gonna achieve the 1%, I'm gonna make it happen. If, if Unless it's zero, if you're telling me there's a chance, I'm gonna make it happen. And so PT, every, boom, boom, learn how to use a chair, learn how to use a bed slide, learn how to use a shower rail and a toilet rail and all these things. Like I was, I was living day to day as if a chair was my, was my future, but I was working in physical therapy as if I wouldn't accept it. And so months, months went by and this one morning came and as responsibly as I can say, I had to use the restroom when you wake up and without, you know, realizing, I got out of bed, walked to the bathroom in the, in the room that I was in and used the bathroom and I flushed the toilet and the nurse that had been looking after me came into my room, saw the chair by my bed and me standing in the bathroom doorway she's like you just what are you doing and i was like i had to use the bathroom she was like you're walking though like, oh yo i am walking that's that's crazy and, and so for me you know call up marvel call up you know, <laughs> Call up Hollywood, let them know 1% chance to walk again. And I did it subconsciously. I didn't even plan to get up this morning and walk, but I did it. And my nurse was a believer, you know, and she, she spent some time with me and she was like, you know, baby, God, God has a plan for you. And, and you know, I, I was so arrogant that I just was like, Thank you. But this was me. 
You know, I put in the work. I was in PT. I, this is me. So thank you. But you, you're gonna probably have to miss me with, with the God did this part for me. <laughs> so back out I go. I get a good job. I'm living on, you know, I'm living on cloud nine. And part of the perks of this new job I got was that they were going to take care of a living situation for me. So free rent after not being able to work for quite some time and a great job equaled 100% I'm there. So I moved in there and some time went by and August 30th came around early morning and Within my home were, you know, some, some noises and came around the, how it was designed was you would walk into the living room when you came into my front door. And then there was the restroom to the right in a hallway and my bedroom to the left, but you couldn't see the living room from the bedroom and you couldn't see the bathroom from the living room. And so I came around the corner looking and what do you know? There's uh, three gentlemen, and uh, they didn't know I was there clearly. So I was like, yeah. I made some noise. They saw me, and I was like, "Yo, what is what's happening?" You know, and again, the the arrogance and the superhuman and the you can't stop me attitude caused me to to make a move and the individual that I couldn't see fully had a gun I didn't know what kind of gun but it was a 45 caliber handgun and he aimed it and the last thing Carla that I remember hearing was the gun go off <clears throat> and so I took a bullet through the right cheek. That bullet exited out behind my right ear after grazing the temporal region of my brain and destroying all of the inner ear mechanics, like the eardrum. I forget the exact medical term, but I believe it's called the conics and a couple other things, but destroyed my inner ear mechanisms and exited out behind my right ear. Now, my neighbor heard a noise. They came and found me on the ground. They called the ambulance. Now, the EMS paperwork and the call that was made to the hospital while I was in route was that I was a DOA expectation, which meant that they assumed fully that by the time I arrived at the hospital, that I would be deceased. Because DOA, for those who don't know, means dead on arrival. And so they called my parents, they let them know the news and how grim my circumstance was and that they needed to make a trip to identify me because I had been shot through the cheek. And so there were deformities and they needed to be sure it was me. And so my parents, by their recollection, headed to the hospital I arrived alive. Uh, fun fact, I was, since I was considered a DOA, I was actually in a body bag, zipped up to under my knee. But that way, if I did pass away on, on the way into the hospital, I believe what they said would have happened was that they would have just zipped me up, taken me to the back for the ME to look at. I believe that's what it is. Don't quote me on that, but that's why I believe they had the, the bag present so they didn't have to, to wheel me in without one. But anyway, so I'm on the ID table and my mom and dad, you know, they, they I don't know, curtain, whatever, they move whatever they need to move so that they can, they can see me. My dad's in disbelief. My mom's hysterical. Yes, that's him. You know, my gosh, you know, what, you know, why? No. And, 
that was it. So they they were waiting for me to pass, which I I wasn't them or there in the moment. But I, I honestly I probably can't I can't just I can't even believe or pretend to believe that I would understand what standing there looking at me felt like to them. But you know, nonetheless, some time passed. And again, out of nowhere, I sat up on the ID on the ID table in a body bag. I sat up, immediately fell back down, and had 25 consecutive what they call breakthrough seizures. And after I went through those breakthrough seizures, I had a pulse that was stable enough. And so I was in a coma, but I was stable enough pulse-wise for them to move me to a surgery room, operate on my brain multiple times in the middle of the brain operations. And after they were able to sustain me there, they were able to move all the bullet fragments, repair the layer around my brain that encapsulates the, cere the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF fluid. They were able to remove tissue from my stomach to reform an ear and to reform the right side of my face. And I woke up several days later and asked what happened. And, you know, the nurse shared with me what happened. And again, you know, I, again, I was, I was like, in more disbelief this time because I had staples in my head. My teeth were wired shut because the, the right hinge of my jaw was also severed by impact along with the facial reactive nerve. So I have what I believe is called Bell's palsy or Herb's palsy. One of those palsy on the right side of my face where my face droops because of that nerve being severed. I am 100% audibly deaf in my right ear. Uh, it's not something where my eardrum's just dead and, you know, God could breathe life back into it. Uh, my eardrum was disintegrated by the bullet. And so I, I have zero hearing and I don't have a canal. I do not have an ear canal. It's artificially made. So if you ever get close enough to me to look at my right ear, it's going to look cosmetically from the exterior like a, it's a functional ear. I don't wear a hearing aid. I don't wear a cover over it. I don't wear anything like that. But if you were to put your finger in my ear, which I have no clue why you would, but if you did, just to give everyone a sense of, of the depth of it, your fingernail would ba barely pass before it met a barrier. And that's the, the plastic surgery that, that was done there. So here's the difference. The first encounter I had where someone told me that it was God, I left, you know, a day and a half after that because I was able to walk. I had no other medical conditions. I left, you know, and I was on monitoring. This situation with the neurological side of it, I was also uh, diagnosed as a epileptic because of the temporal region damage that I had. Uh, I still had CSF drainage. I had to let my, the hole in my stomach where they drew all the stomach tissue heal properly. I had to go through tests and I had to sign waivers because they they have used my story now in some textbooks here and some videos and stuff like that just because of the nature of the rarity of surviving such a thing. And the nurse I had this time, also a believer, but this nurse, was was much different. So a nurse has her shift. And for those of you who have been in a hospital or work in a hospital, you have a, a wing that you're assigned to like ICU or the emergency room or whatever, but you do you do it in shifts. You don't look over the same room every night. But this nurse, even if she wasn't my nurse, was there every day, every single day. And in the morning, she would come in while I was, you know, sitting there drinking my breakfast because I couldn't chew food and pray. 
and then she would sit there and read the word to me. And where am I going? There's, I, I'm sound like I can run out of there. I got tubes that, you know, and so she was so kind hearted. It just, it, it literally pierced my stubbornness about it. And I just, I couldn't move. So I sat there and I listened. I did the respectable thing and I listened. You know, my parents going anywhere. Right, I wasn't going, I was not moving. So <laughs> it couldn't run. And, and the, the crazy thing is I was in a, I was in a bed under heavy medical attention, being surveilled often, tests being done on me. She came and she went freely. There, there was nothing holding her to doing that, but yet she still did it. And so my parents would be there to pray with them. Uh, we would read the word day after day after day after day. And so I got the news that I was gonna get to leave the hospital and start my own self-care. And not an emotional person, but that last day was was pretty tough for me when I when I was speaking to her. And you know, she you know, she was clearly strong in her walk. You know, she was also not afraid to attempt at least to introduce me to who he was or disciple me into at least planting me somewhere. And so, you know, that last day she had a long talk with me. She said, you know. Look here, kiddo, you know, it's been it's been great spending time with you. You know, you're a true miracle of God and people need to hear this story because there's a lot of people out there that that don't believe things like this are possible. And she said, before you go out there and you start telling your story, because there's gonna be people that that seek you out for this story, go find a church and get connected. He said, that, that is all I want from you. And I was like, how can I tell this lady who spent unequivocal amounts of time with me for zero reason whatsoever because, besides she wanted to and look her in her face and, and, and lie to her and say, yeah, I'll go and never go. And so here's the crazy part. I got released Sunday morning. And I was like, ooh, Sunday month. <laughs> no dodging this. And so I left the hospital, went to church, walked in and got greeted, you know, with the praise God, God bless you. Are you new here? Here's a here's a new member card, all that all that stuff. Went and found my seat in the in the back row, in the corner away from everybody. Yeah. And worship started. You know, that's how they started. They did a greeting and then they went into worship. It looked like a miniature concert, and words playing on projector screens and instruments. And I was like, okay. First couple of songs, I just read the words because they were more upbeat. But then they moved to like the the like the more deep worship where it was slower songs, more meaningful meanings. And I don't, I cannot recollect why, but I just lost myself for a second. I, I literally, I just was like, wow, this is, this is beautiful. I started to, I could like almost feel the words. And I was like, this is, this is something I need to pay attention to. And they had a, a median in the middle of worship because worship got so powerful that they said, if there's anyone here that wants to give their life to the Lord, come to the front and, and we'll pray with you and we'll show you how you can start your journey in the kingdom. And I went, I, I left the back row, I walked to the front and gave my life to the Lord. The crazier part is after I did that and sat back down, the, the title of the message that day was a second chance. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way. 
<laughs> that I was run over and should have been paralyzed, but I'm walking. That I was shot in the head and should be dead, but I'm alive. The day I get out, I make a promise to a nurse who was a believer that I'd go to church. I get out of the hospital on a Sunday. I find a church. I give my life to the Lord. And the title of the message is A Second Chance. There's, there, was, there was just no way. And so that was six plus years ago that that took place. I've been in the kingdom ever since then. You know, I I minister and pray with people through street ministry. I've been in prison ministry. The, the main vehicle of how I decided to share the gospel is through rap music. I, I minister through music, but I also fearless when it comes to like street preaching and praying with the a homeless and I would like to say that I I feel like I actively serve in the kingdom. I serve my brothers and sisters as as God will serve or as close as I can. And you know it's my story a lot of people focus in on the amazing things that God has brought me through because I'm you know, not denying that the things that he has brought me through are amazing. But what I always try to like to reframe it around is had one believer not intentionally yeah. take the effort to connect, exhort, and edify a young man who was just garbage at that moment and show him and create a connection that was worth me keeping my word I would have never gone to church I'd have never gone through that worship service when I did I would have never given my life to the Lord I would have never seen the title of the message and nothing would have resonated with me in that moment the way that it did and so you know she got me a bible that day too it had my name on it and everything and you know, that's, that's something I hold near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I still send her a card, you know, every year uh, thanking her. You and see, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, your story, it's been quite a journey. It is, but you know what amazes me from the moment that your birth mother put you in a fire station. You think of a fire station, and you can look at it in two words. Holy Spirit is fire. You are already protected then. And then you went into an orphan. And then there's parents picked you, already selected. And you were already on someone else's heart even before you knew. Even though as a kid, you know, you were stubborn. Uh, I, I was, because I was burnt as a child and severely burned. And um, so, and I was raised in the church. I made a point when I got 18 to walk away from the church. That was a decision I made because I wanted to see how the opposite side lived. Dumb, yes, <laughs> stupid. 100%. But I went all the way crazy. I'll tell people that I worshiped the devil, got into Wicca, got into this, got into that, you name it, I got into it. But I had a praying mom, you see, just like those two ladies that were sent to you, the first one and the second. Those were praying women, and they never stopped praying for you. See, just like my mama. My mama is gone and she's in heaven, but God honors a praying woman or a praying man. He'll honor your prayers. What you show uh, young men is that you can be as bad as you want to be, 
but God's still pursuing you. And he pursued you anyway, you know? Right. And even right now, the ministries that you choose to go into, one of the things I, I, I really want people to also hear as I was able to hear one of his rapping, he's, I don't know if he's gonna feel like it guys, but I would really love for you to give us just a little bit of your rap, if you like. Sure. And also sure. talk about that program that you wanted me to like because you are nominated. Talk about that a little bit as well. Sure. So since I don't have music to actively play, I'll just do a spoken word for you. Uh, yeah. it, you know, lyrically, you know, designed to be done without music. Yeah. I'll be happy and humble to share that with you. And then, yeah, I'll go over, you know, the, Yes. The other amazing work of God. So, <clears throat> uh, glory to God. So, this man was dead in sin until the Lord God intervened and took this filthy, dirty, disgusting person and made him clean. I'm free, but not because of me. No, that's only because of the son. On the tree, he paid the price. Yeah, because of me. He was hung. They battered and beat him brutally, then sharply pierced his lungs. Although physically I was absent, I'm guilty for what was done. Without blood, there's no remission for the sins that we've been, for the sins that we've forgiven. Jesus, the living sacrifice given for our forgiveness. I'll be the first to admit it. I can't believe that he did it, but he did it. We serve in the living God. Go and get it. Go get it. Yes, seek salvation. Praise the Lord for what he's done because it's not victory we're working towards. It's victory we're working from. It's done. Wow. I, all I can say is, wow. That was, wow. <laughs> it got me speechless here, buddy. <laughs> uh, oh God. Thank you. No, 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 babe. Thank you. That is uh, extremely powerful. And, uh, and you could tell that's from your heart. And you should speak those words everywhere you go because that was really awesome. Okay, so now tell us about the other program. So um, if anybody out there is a frequent listener, of the Christian hip hop community. There is a producer slash artist uh, named K Drama, who is very well known. He's been around for quite a long time as someone who's represented the Christian hip hop brand well and uh, has done so by glorifying God first. And so I followed him for a long time and he just recently released a challenge on Facebook entitled A Different World Challenge, where he wanted individuals to write a verse and create a video of you rapping or ministering your verse over his beat. He was going to select a group of finalists, and then he would have voting go on for a week, and then the Christian hip hop artist or minister who had the most votes at the end of that week, which is November the 18th, I believe it is this coming Thursday, uh, would get an opportunity to actually then be featured on the remixed version of the song that he did and have it be placed on his album that's coming up soon. And so I waited until the second to last day to, to submit my verse. and. Glory to God, he selected me as one of the, the four finalists. And, you know, so now the voting process is on. And, you know, the way I look at, at challenges and voting and competition is that the kingdom of God at the, at the end of the day isn't about wins for me unless we're talking about souls to the kingdom. And it's not about the boastful nature of, hey, I won this contest. But for me, what this symbolized was, hey, whether four people got selected as finalists or 200 people got selected as finalists, we all win because ultimately, if your heart was that to 
if your heart's intent of this con competition or this challenge or whatever it was and entering into it was that God was glorified in what you did, then we all win ultimately at the end of the day. So whether you were selected, whether you weren't, doesn't matter to me. Whether I finish with the most votes, the least votes, doesn't matter to me. All I really am concerned about is, is what I did, what God would have had me do, and is what he then released me to do, honor and glorify only him. That's really all that I, I'm concerned about when it comes to music and creativity, because I believe that he entrusts the anointing to you. And it's borrowed. And to use an anointing in the kingdom for the purpose and intent of glorifying the kingdom for anything other than that is that you just it just wouldn't sit right with me. So, um, yeah, again, not to count both, but, you know, to God be the glory. Currently, uh, the last time I think I was updated, I think that I am currently the video with the most likes. I think that I have 182 likes and the next person has 72. And so, you know, some people will be super stoked about that. To me, you know, it it puts me in a position where I, you know, I just I'm humbled, and it just gives me even that much more of a reason to to wake up and. Well, I'm super stoked. I'll be super stoked for you. How is that? I I receive it. I do. <laughs> I receive it. I will. I will live vicariously through your stokedness. If that's okay. Oh boy, forget it. Um, forget, uh, uh. It's like, oh no, she done left the building. <laughs> I believe. But one of the things that um, I think is amazing is how God has turned your, your life around. How is your relationship with your parents now? I visit them weekly. Yeah. Um, my mom and, and my dad are, when you, when you look back at it and you're like, wow, I was, I was about, again, if we want to talk about votes, I was probably one of the absolute worst children that could have possibly existed nope. after being, <laughs> no, I'm good. Oh my goodness nope. gracious. No, no, I got you beat. I was rotten. I was spoiled. And I played every card known to man. <laughs> I was just horrible. I was so yep. bad. And yep. <laughs> I'm like, but you know what? If even after all that and all of the mishaps and the late calls at night and the not showing up and the all that stuff. My parents would have dropped what they were doing at any time of the day to come make sure I was all right, even despite it. And so now that, you know, I am representing the kingdom, and, you know, God is at the center of my life. Gotta honor your parents. And you know, it, it's funny because I, you know, I hear people say, oh, I was a rotten Johnson. Mm. No. <laughs> I, um, I remember I used to play the card. And if you don't know what that is, it's the card you play with your mama when you get mad at her. It's like, I thought you were a Christian. <laughs> ah, that was me. <laughs> Every time I get mad at her and she'll say something, I'll say, you can't whoop me. You're a Christian woman. That is just not Christian. You're acting like Satan. <laughs> this is the card I pulled. I was my, like, yeah, I don't know that card. <laughs> my card was, why did y'all adopt me to, to prevent me from, from you know, being who I want to be? Oh, you played that card. I was out there. I was Play out that there. card. I was out there. I had a whole, if you know what sam's club or costco is i went to one of those two stores i bought every last one of those cards stocked them up in my room and used them often i every single i couldn't go hang out with my friends i couldn't have the sleepover i couldn't stay out an hour later 
I couldn't, you know, play another hour of video games. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Can't for why did you even adopt me then? You know, yelling. I wish someone else would have adopted me. You know, all sorts of filth came out of my mouth. Disrespectful, just yeah. nonsense. And so it's important to me. My parents are up in age. And still, if my car broke down tomorrow, my dad would show up with tools, limp in, crawl under the vehicle and fix it still, even with bad hips and bad knees. And I just tell you how fortunate, you know, I tell people this. My mom has passed away. And um, so for me, I tell people, you know, dude, don't miss out, you know, because, you know, even though you may not have the best mom or the best dad, they're still living. And as long as they're living, there's an opportunity because when they pass away, there is no more opportunity. You know, I didn't realize, you know, uh, what I would miss. Now I'm born in, everyone who knows, I was born in Oklahoma. I am an extremely spoiled child. I'm just gonna put it out there. So during the holidays, we have a huge family. So it is like 60 people. So she cooks for everyone. It's just all over. I never knew that when she passed, I would go away because I've had it all my life. You just assume it would always be there. Right. See, those little gifts, the little nuggets. And I look back now and I go, wow, you know, mom used to make caramel popcorn balls and, you know, and, and caramel apples and, and, you know, just these little things that you just, you don't think about that are just so simple and easy, but you, you get used to them. And um, so when, when she passed, I didn't, I'm like, wow, who's going to do all these things? You know, how am I going to So know what I ended up doing? This is, this is who I really am. I ended up because I, still waiting for God to deliver my husband. Thank you, Jesus. But until then I started adopting people. <laughs> I, I'm going to be the mother, mother goose in the shoe or somebody. I'm just going to adopt everybody. I'm going to have a huge family and then I get together and I cook for them. That's what I do. That's what I did in Europe. Uh, that's what I did in Hollywood with my, with my rock band. That's just who I am. I realize I love that because then I'm able to express love through food and talk. And, and, and I tell people, don't miss the opportunity that God gives you. And so when I heard your story, I was like, I love that story. He has a story. You know, not all of us had a perfect childhood. It wasn't me. And I'm going to tell everyone, if you had a perfect childhood, but then I can't listen to your testimony because you ain't gone through anything. I need someone who's gone through some stuff to talk to me because I need to know that I can get on the other side of that. Right. And that's what your story tells people, regardless right. of adoption, regardless yeah. of the trouble and the drugs and whatever, regardless of anything. Yes, what you got? I don't know if this is appropriate, but it reminded me of what you just said. Okay, I can't say it. Oh, um, get over here i don't know if i can say it with this there's well okay so this is another little girl <laughs> that i adopt this is Haley. this I, is my little cupcake oh, really? <laughs> adopting people <laughs> sorry this just reminded me of what you said um but it's a sick sense of humor a sick sense of humor is the most attractive quality a person can have if you're not hilariously dark and twisted there's no way i can tell you've survived emotional trauma or thrived with crippling anxiety and shows me that you'll be absolutely useless in future situations. Now that is very facetious yeah. and sarcastic, but it reminded me a little bit of what you were saying. Yeah, it, it does because as a bird survivor, I remember them telling me, you need to go see a doctor, right. you know, to talk about your burns and all this stuff. And I'm like, uh, okay, so I go, I go to the shrink and I'm looking at the shrink because I'm looking to see if she got some burns. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but that's what I'm looking for. I'm 14. You're going to talk to me. You better have some freaking burns on your skin. Oh, so I I'm looking. I, I don't see nothing. And she goes, what you looking for? I'm looking for some burns. She goes, why is it? You can't tell me how to get over burn scars if you ain't never had any. I get it. 
I said, did you die and come back? No, then you ain't talking to me. Have you had third degree burns? Oh, did your skin fall off? No. Hey, what are you? Ma, I'm ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's I get it. Now. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's your story. Yeah, I mean, I have that same difficulty, but I think it opens a lot of cool doors for me because if somebody meets me at an event where I'm speaking or where I get to share music or, or preach a word or something like that, and they, they come up to me at the end when there's an altar call or, or some sort of opportunity for me to pray with them. Yeah. I'm like, you know, Drew, I really need your prayer, man. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through this. Like, yes. Tell me about it. Tell me about yeah. what you think you can make it through. And they'll be like, man, I'm struggling to pay my car note, man. I don't think I'm going to be able to pay it. They're probably going to take my car. And I was like, they are far greater concerns or far greater battles to be concerned of currently than whether or not you're going to be able to pay your bills and see the way I always look at it is when someone says as soon as someone says I don't know if I can get through something I always try to reframe it for them I'm like you're right you're 100% right you cannot you you're not going to because your strength is is not enough and your approach is not the approach of of the lord and so if it would be very easy for me to say a car note well i got run over by a car <laughs> or you know you can't pay your car note i i got shot in the head and was pronounced pretty much dead Yes. And here I am to talk to you about the God I serve. And the God I serve says that if you give this issue to him and your heart is for him, mm -hmm. that car note's going to get paid. But mm -hmm. you got to start walking by faith and not sight. And so I, I can 100% relate with, hey, I went, to a, I went to a shrink, sat down. This person is going to speak to me about hey. burns. And you are unscathed. Yeah. And that makes zero sense to me. Because if you haven't walked it, you ain't gonna listen. your information is out of a book. And I might as well. And, and that's and that's pretty. So what they did, they took me to a vet. Mm -hmm. And this veteran had Agent Orange spread on him. Mm -hmm. You know what that's that is a chemical that burns the skin. And, and so what ended up happening, he, I looked at him, he's looking at me, and I'm trying to see where his scars are. He goes, what you got? I said, what you got? Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm showing him my, my scars. I'm like, look, I got this. He goes, look, I got this. I said, I got this. And we're like showing each other our scars like a badge of honor. And then he says to me, I didn't have any morphine in mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I go, what? <laughs> he goes, I was in the field in a, in Vietnam, when the Agent Orange got spread, I was still fighting with my skin on fire. And I looked at him and I go, and I was laying in the hospital bed with morphine. And I just looked at him, I said, okay, I can get through this. He goes, yeah, you will be. And most people don't realize that a burnt female, the rate of suicide is so high for them because they would rather kill themselves than to live with being burned because their options are so small. See, people don't realize that. So when you sit there and you talk about your options, and this is what I try to tell people, you're giving young men options. Right. Drew, that's what Lord you're giving God. them. Lord God. Mm. And I want you to know that because I'm trying to get more men to give their testimony mm -hmm. so other men can hear that it's okay to give your testimony. It's okay to be out there for God. It's okay to be human. Get out there. Tell it. Scream it from the rooftop if you got to. Oh, yeah. It is so okay. It is. Here's the best part. Oh, it's yeah. the best part about being a man is being in love with Jesus. It's true. Because ain't no man going to approach me if he ain't in love with Jesus. Because Jesus is first. If you ain't in love with Jesus, don't even come near me because it ain't going to work. Amen. And that's what you have. 
Jesus is all over you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. And God has a wife for you, my friend. She's on the way. I received it. I received that. Huh? I received that. I appreciate it. In God's time. When he's ready, he's ready. Yes, I'll be ready. Now, I want you to give me one more of those beautiful things because I know everyone didn't get a chance to hear. He, he gave it, he, he did a spoken word and made me cry. Oh, I was gonna ask you. So, yeah. I give you another spoken word, baby. Ah, uh, okay. I'll do my best. Yes. Uh, <laughs> when I was lost, I thought that God had a distaste for me. I was running from my problems thinking that I could escape from me. Ready to give up, made up my mind there was no saving me. Sin was still enslaving me, but God was watching carefully. Chasing me, not erasing me, but molding, sculpting, and making me. The world was steady breaking me, but God was watching patiently. <laughs> mm. 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 And then I'll, I'm, I'm going to do... Uh, I'll do this. Okay, this is... Uh, it's going to be... <laughs> A separation and then it'll be some some lyrics so it's like yeah he gave his life yo he yo he paid a price yeah he gave a gift because he, he gave his life so that i could live he took filthy rags and he cleaned me up he took empty drew and he filled me up Lord, what did I do to deserve a love that was oh so true? And how can a man, God, repay you, God, for the things you do? It's impossible. I swear, there's just no way that I can. Unstoppable, my God. So I lift and reach both my hands like save me from myself. My own strength's not good enough. God, I'm nothing without you here. Without you near, it's crystal clear. I'm empty, God. Yeah, I'm crystal clear. You're oh so good to me, God. This man right here can't help but shed tears. You took the cross and bled for me, and that same blood washed away my fears. I don't get it. How could my king pay a price like that for a man like me who cursed his name, spit on you, and turn my back? Lord, you're good. Lord, you're good. And I don't deserve a single day, but you say I do, so it must be true. So I'm going to lift my hands in praise. Amen. Wow. Wow, baby. Thank you so much. Thank you. Drew, if you could say one word to the young men out there, what would it be? Let me let me say what the Holy Spirit would say. The Holy Thanks. Spirit just, just got me and what you would have me say in this moment. So if I was if a young man was listening and had an opportunity to hear what God has done in my life through my testimony or or any of you know what I shared with, with God's anointing. My one word to you would be courage. You know, it's it's not easy to be a man in the world and share your testimony of what God has done in your life for two reasons. First, we're, we're built and we're convinced with the social dynamic of the world that to share anything that causes us to appear weak and someone else to be the provider is is not what a man does and the younger you are the more prevalent that is and i would say that whether you realize it now like i do after going through so much and refusing to just take a moment and reflect on the things that you've been through, the things that you've accomplished, that you feel you've accomplished in yourself or on your own strength. And just ask God to reveal your heart in those situations. And when he reveals your heart in those situations, repent, ask forgiveness, and contact people like Sister Carla and share your testimony with people because there is outside of the will of God in your life and the word of God 
and scriptures. There's not a whole lot more powerful things out there than someone's genuine testimony of weakness, brokenness, lost, blind, whatever it is, whatever you overcame in God have the courage to tell somebody about it because your testimony could be the only Bible they've ever read. Your testimony could be the only Jesus they've ever met. Your testimony could be the only cross or the altar to, to burn a sacrifice. It could be the, it could be the only representation of the kingdom that they've ever seen. Preach, and, baby. <laughs> Preach my, it. my opinion of the situation would be, when courage is rooted in Christ, self-righteous pride has no place to, to overcome that. And so when you make yourself vulnerable, but vulnerable in Christ, and you make yourself transparent, but transparent in Christ, there is no weakness. There is only strength. And so the world is lying to you if they're telling you that to share your story about what God has done in your life makes you weak or makes you less of a man. It, it, it actually makes you a man of God, which comes with the armor of God, which is, in my opinion, far more powerful than someone pretending God has done nothing in their life. And so that was not one word, but, <laughs> you it, was a, but it was a word. It was and a I just hope the young people out there, especially the young men, realize that we are in a position where that that second visit is is coming soon and the time is now to stand up rise up stand strong and share your testimony you know hey i'll be happy to if anybody out there who who is listening has actually heard my testimony before and you're just afraid to even reach out to sister carla reach out to me and i'll connect you with her but Drew what she's doing you What's know, she doing? <laughs> you, you're 100 percent right, babe. You know, when I start, when God asked me to do this, and I was like, I've got to find men to do testimony. I said, because our men are being left out, the young men. Mm -hmm. And if we don't reach out to them as my brother in Christ. Who will? Right. And uh, when, when Jesus says time to come home, I want him to say, well done, servant. You've done it all. You did everything I asked you. I, I don't leave not one rock unturned. So when he asked you, uh-huh, I did it. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know what it feels like to think that no one's out there for you. Yep. I know what it feels like, you know, um, to be alone. Boy, I, I understand that more than most people will ever think. Yeah, I know what it feels like when you said that your mother gave you up. My mother died having me, mm. okay? So my mama was my grandmother, so people can understand. Right. So when you talk about, you know, why did you adopt me? See, I didn't have that issue. What I said is how dare my mother died and left me here. She abandoned me. She is, I mean, oh, honey, when I got angry, when I tell you, I was one of those kids, when I got angry, you you don't even want to be near me. It's, it's like, it's like all, all hell breaks open. And it's like, I remember one day she said, it's you were just when you get angry. I said, what? She goes like, hell freezes over. You walk over Satan. I said, he better get out of my way when I get angry because I ain't taking nothing. <laughs> Not even for him. <laughs> That's how angry I would get. So I understand anger. I understand unforgiveness. Boy, do I understand if I thought I needed unforgiveness to be successful. How stupid right. is that? But that's what the world tells you. It is. Yeah. I thought I need bitterness and hardness and, and not to give in and not to, you know, all this stuff. And it's all wrong. It's yeah. wrong. Because to really have a heart is to have the heart after God. Correct. And um, uh, the, the, it's the ultimate love. Mm -hmm. 
And you cannot have bitterness and have love. You cannot have unforgiveness and have love. You cannot have hatred and have love. You cannot have both. You cannot serve two gods in the same heart. It's only one heart. That's right. It will not be divided. And so I just, I just want to thank you, my brother, for, for you're my first male to share the story. I'm so excited. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so uh, I just want to say thank you and God bless. And I would love for you if you ever have the time and you just want to do spoken words, uh, please do spoken words and then post it on my site. Absolutely. Because I love to have it. I will put it up on Red Letter Awards. I love the spoken word about Jesus. I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't do it. But evidently, God gave a gift to you. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I'm i here to, to serve and as long as it's aligned with the will of God and, and God gets the glory. I, I feel in my spirit that, that that is where you are. And that is why I'm here. I, I know um, being the, I did not know I was going to be the first male ever on, on on here but that's i mean that's that's really cool but i i plan to i plan to send some i plan to send some brothers to you and i'm, I'm excited we'll, we'll see what happens you know you you, you know, parcel that out with the holy spirit and decide who you want to use but yeah, I would, I, i'm definitely going to send them your way i would do group sections I'll do three at a time i don't care let's get it on oh yeah baby oh, jesus let's work it <laughs> Work it. <laughs> and then absolutely, you know, and then anytime I do a or the Lord gives me a spoken word, I you know, I definitely get it to you. That way you can you I know can, what I'm gonna call it. it God squad. There you go. <laughs> ready. And then if, you know, if, if, if we're getting ready to if we're getting ready to wrap up here, then you know what I usually like to do when, when someone hey, invites me. I'm Just sorry. Thank you. God bless you. I want to pray with you though before I go. That's that's definitely what I'm gonna do. Amen. You know, so Whew. Father God, you are you are so good. In the midst of our mess, Father, there's a message. And Lord God, today I say that you move on the hearts and minds of of your children, Father, and that you move them to a point of confidence. Not just confidence in their self, but confidence in who they became through you, Father, what they overcame with you, Father, and that my sister Carla would start to get a double portion of young men that want to share their testimony in such an environment, Father. So, Lord, I first, I thank you for opening this door. God, I thank you for divine appointments, God. And Lord, I feel this was one. So God, I don't need, I don't need to know, and I don't know what my sister Carla is currently praying for, Father. But Lord, that the desires, you know, that her prayers, don't just make it to the right hand of you, Father, but make it to you, Father. But that you put an express stamp on those answers to her prayers, Father God. But that you prepare her heart for a new season of overflow, God. That you continue to use this media outlet that she has obediently started, Father. And that you take it to new levels, Lord God, that you open a door that she wasn't expecting to be open, Father. But Father, I just thank you for your servant, Carla. I thank you for your daughter, Lord. For the things that you brought her through are nothing short of tremendous. And you give all the doctors all the credit you want, Father. But we know at the end of the day, the doctors were simply your tools, Father God. But it was your will and your plan, Father. So God, I say, whoever's involved, in this media outlet, I say whoever Sister Carla has adopted, Lord God, that you bless them. 
Father, that you that you bless them with a heart for you, God, that you bless them with a mind and a focus, Lord God, that is centered around you, your word, Lord God, that you ignite a fire in them to dive deeper into your word, deeper into prayer, deeper into worship, Father. And Lord God, that you surround and encamp Sister Carla and all those that she connects with, Father, with your angels, protect their mind, protect their hearts, Father. And God, I say thank you that today, although I was the first to speak, you were the first to decide I was going to be the first to speak, Father. So right now, I thank you, Lord. I say many more occasions such as this and further communication with me and my sister will continue, Lord God. And Lord, whatever I can do, Father, utilize me. Utilize me in, in the plans of God that you, that you have for her, Father. So just thank you for everything that you do, everything you are and everything you're planning to do. We ask these things and seal these things. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, my brother. Mwah! Much love to you, babe. Good Salute. night. I appreciate you. Good night. Southern California, Texas. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.